The fiat system encourages chaos. We saw Bitcoin go from 4,000 to 70, which is about 17 and a half times. So we're sitting here at what, 58K? If we make it 60K for uh, ease of numbers, 17 and a half times of that is a million 50,000. They always say money rules the world. I think beneath that is energy rules the world. The US is pulling the monetary arm. The BRICS nations are pulling the energy arm. At a certain point, these things are gonna collide. Bitcoin could be a million dollars in this cycle. And I truly believe that. I see kind of like two paths to like hyper Bitcoinization. The first path is everything crashes and burns. And then we basically have to rebuild it up. The other path is we get presidents in there like Trump or like some of these others that would wanna keep the strength in the dollar, recognizing the true power of Bitcoin, delaying that hyper Bitcoinization, which gives the builders time to build on the lightning network and other things like that. So we can get to that place. The rich are gonna get richer, the poor are gonna get poorer, and then the poor are basically gonna rebel. Retirement accounts, I think social security, all that stuff is, is almost a sham here in the US. I think everybody would come to the conclusion, just buy Bitcoin and hold it. Bitcoiners kind of resonate, like fix the money, fix the world so much because of all the underlying issues and stresses and things like that, that money causes. I think, uh, you know, Bitcoin can help fix a lot of those things. Your podcast is called Green Candle Podcast. I love that, love that name a lot. Uh, the first obvious, maybe fun question is, when are we seeing the the awaited green god candle that we all want <laughs> yeah man it seems like it's like everything's kind of leading up to it so uh you know last time we we kind of had some you know issues with the interest rate market and everything in the US um you know was the covid crash and everything right we had basically inflated everything right in 2020 we saw bitcoin crash from you know uh, 20k or so down to down to four, and we saw it shoot back up all the way up to 70,000. You know, why did we really see that? Well, it was a, basically a bunch of QE quantitative easing, and in that sense, it was a bunch of money being dumped into the market. Another form of that is pulling back interest rates. So we have interest rates that uh, that rose basically at an all time pace here recently, and they've been staying very high. Um, you know, we're recording this in the 13th. I think the Fed is meeting in the next couple of weeks. And the, the plan is for them to start pulling back the reins, uh, you know, to start cutting interest rates. So, you know, I, I mean, crystal ball here, I'm not quite sure exactly when, but I mean, we saw essentially Bitcoin go from 4,000 to 70, which is about 17 and a half times. So we're sitting here at what, 58K, if we make it 60K for for uh, ease of numbers, 17 and a half times of that is a million 50,000. So, I mean, if we see th that amount of quantitative easing that we saw in during the COVID crisis, I think it's coming very soon because interest rates coming down. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of turbulent economic times going on here. I don't think the consumer's as strong as everybody says. And I think, you know, um, besides all that too, like, you know, there's a lot of geopolitical tension too in the air. So, um, you know, the fiat system encourages chaos, right? So uh, in 2020, we had the COVID pump and dump, basically. So this time it might be other geopolitical pressures, but I think it's coming soon. I think it's coming soon. And uh, I think that the money printing and uh, the money printer is going to start to go burr here pretty quick. It's also interesting for me when, when we look at like uh, monetary policy and energy and, and the war coming up, like there's so many interesting uh, macro factors that come into play and, and kind of all intertwine to, to each other. Do, do you see a connection between like uh, monetary policy from a fiat currency standpoint, from Bitcoin and especially with, with energy? Also, like a lot of people say like Bitcoin is energy money. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, I think everything is connected in the overall economic policy, um, you know, everything. And I think beneath the, you know, they always say money rules the world. I think beneath that is energy rules the world. So I think we're kind of in an interesting impasse here right now where, you know, the BRICS nations, Russia, um, you know, China and everything, they're almost playing the energy card, right? I mean, Russia is a very energy dense country. You saw what they were doing, you know, obviously what, what's going on in Ukraine, but what they're doing is essentially, you know, with the US trying to pull, put tariffs on them and everything like that. If Russia wanted to, they could essentially just pull back the reins and not sell anybody oil in Europe and, you know, shit would really hit the fan. What the US is doing is they're pulling the monetary policy arm. So, 
I think, you know, it's not necessarily like as drastic as the Cold War, but I think that that's what's kind of going on here is that the U.S. is pulling the monetary arm, the BRICS nations are pulling the energy arm. And at, at a certain point, these things are going to collide. Now, what is going to be the driving factor or something that really pushes that over the edge? I'm not quite sure. I mean, we do have an election coming up here in November. So, uh, you know, everybody kind of likes to think of the U.S. like, you know, everything revolves around us, which, you know, it kind of does because we have the, the U.S. Uh, dollar here. But uh, I think that could be something that definitely pushes it over the edge, especially if we get the wrong leadership in place. So I, I do think that everything's connected. Uh, that's why I, you know, I speak to a lot of people, not only in the Bitcoin space, but in the, you know, economic space, energy space and everything like that, because, you know, I think whatever lever is pulled, uh, I think can affect prices of whatever good across the, across the globe. Right. I think, you know, if, if oil and gas becomes extremely expensive to import into the U.S., bananas are going to be more expensive at the grocery store because somebody's got to drive their car, uh, drive and transport the bananas from wherever they got them into the grocery store so that that underlying cost is always going to be you know more expensive and so for you know the the grocery store to uh, to pay their workers they're going to have to do that and then you know if everything goes up the the prices of uh, employees is always going to go up so i think you know everything in this sense is always interconnected and uh, yeah, I definitely think that the Bitcoin, you know, really helps by solving a lot of these, by encouraging renewable energy, by encouraging, uh, you know, the use of, uh, you know, getting more efficient energy uh, prices and everything like that, too. So uh, I definitely think it's all interconnected and it's something that uh, is going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out in the next few months, to say the very least. How important or how impactful do you think is, is the election uh, that is coming up in, in, in November, no matter if it's uh, Trump or Harris, probably will, <laughs> probably will be one of those two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but uh, is, is, is that, do you think that has an actual impact on, on, on Bitcoin, on the price and the adoption curves? I do. Um, and I, I think that it's more so uh, just because of their economic policies. Um, you know, I think Kamala Harris has kind of seen the the big bump in, um, you know, Trump going to the Bitcoin conference and everything like that. Um, now her campaign is accepting crypto for donations. I think it's all kind of fake. Um, but what I truly believe is, is, is more of uh, people really have it out for Donald Trump, meaning that there's a lot of um, I guess people with a lot of power, meaning a lot of money that don't really like Donald Trump because he's exposing a lot of what's going on in the fiat system. I think in 2016, we really saw that the American people are really, you know, fiending for something like that. They've been realizing that the politicians have been lying to us for years and years and years. And Donald Trump was the first one to kind of expose that. Um, you know, every politician comes in, they're going to help save you. They're going to help, you know, do whatever. When in reality, none of them really are, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're all just there just to stay in power and, and get elected. Now, what I think is going to happen if Donald Trump gets elected is that, you know, the powers that be are going to sell off the stock market, uh, which includes Bitcoin now with the ETFs. You're going to see a big crash because there's a lot of cracks underneath the surface. So, you know, the powers that be want to make everything crash for him. And then Donald Trump's going to have to rebuild that in the next three and a half, four years, um, where I, I think basically at this point, no matter what you do, there's. Uh, a recession looming, whether it's uh, the severity of that, we don't really know. But if I think, you know, Kamala Harris gets in office, what I think is going to happen, they're going to pull back interest rates, and then they're going to throw a bunch of money into the system, they're going to print a bunch of money. So everything gets inflated for a couple years. And then, you know, come this time in four years, they're going to be saying the same song and dance. I mean, if you look back, the past 16 years, a Democrat's been in, in power uh, 12 out of the last 16, with only the only Republican candidate being Donald Trump. And that economy, for you know, for better or for worse, it, it was one of the be better booming economies during that time period. So, you know, I think that uh, you know the powers that be really want uh, a, a Democrat president now. We'll see how that all goes. I, I mean, I'm kind of doing a little tinfoil hat thing here where I think that everybody's kind of, I got it out for Donald Trump, but I think, you know, if the assassination attempt and, um, you know, kind of the way the media in the U.S. portrays Donald Trump, 
I, I feel like it's kind of obvious here where, where nobody that is in, in actual power really wants it, where the people on the ground, if you go to an X poll or something like that, that Elon puts out, Trump wins by a landslide. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just because of, uh, you know, the audience that's on X, but I, I find it harder, harder to believe that uh, the polling and everything like that is really, truly, um, you know, I guess, reflective of the United States people. That's interesting. I, I like to look at um, uh, polling market uh, because they're like people actually bet money on it. Uh, it's it's interesting how, how, how those those go, and I think he's actually in front of that. But it's an interesting point that you mentioned that uh, with Trump, uh, Bitcoin could actually dump because Harris will print basically more money, and the powers to be will will continue as they are. Because yeah, a lot of people seem to not realize that, but. Harris right now is already the vice president. So like, it's not a, not a course change completely. It's like the last four years again, I don't think there will be a lot of changes when, 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 when she comes in. So what I hear you saying is Harris could be short term better for Bitcoin because uh, she will print a bunch of money, but it will be worse for, for the USA. Yeah, I mean, you know, Bitcoin as uh, the U.S. dollar exchange rate, it would be better, I think, in the short term. But, you know, I put out a tweet the other day and I'll just read uh, uh, some of these numbers to you. So price increases since 2020. Car payments are up 40 percent. Food prices up 25 percent. Electricity up 30 percent. Gas 35 transportation home prices are up 48 percent. Auto insurance and gasoline are up 50 plus percent. And mortgage rates are up 244%. So, I mean, like, you know, it could be greater in the dollar exchange rate, but how much is your purchasing power really going up? You know, I think that that's what we should really be looking at as far as like the Bitcoin price, right? I, I don't really like looking at it and the US dollar exchange rate, right? I mean, everybody says, you know, the, the classic saying one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, but you know, and I came out here and said that Bitcoin could be a million dollars in this cycle. And I truly believe that because, you know, at the, at the same time, like, you know, the way that they're devaluing the dollar, it's at, a, at an extreme rate. Uh, but the problem with all of that is that, I, like many of us in the Bitcoin space know, is that B Bitcoin at a million dollars might not get you as much as Bitcoin at a million dollars like 10 years ago. I, it actually, it definitely won't, right? I mean, you know, at this point, they're devaluing everything. Your purchasing power is just going to go down. But yeah, I mean, I think in the short term, Kamala Harris might be better for the Bitcoin price action, but I think she's going to cause inflation to go th through the absolute roof. Um, and I think, you know, it's kind of uh, maybe uh, the acceleration as to what would want her uh, in office because it'll accelerate the devaluing of the dollar here and uh, accelerate, uh, you know, almost the downfall of the U S so, but as an American, I want this to be kind of, uh, you know, I guess a slower process. So I always ask this, I, I see kind of like two paths to like big hyper Bitcoinization. The first path is everything crashes and burns. And then we basically have to rebuild it up. There's a bunch of, you know, uh, countries around the globe that are, you know, showing some strength. Maybe it's China, maybe it's Russia, maybe it's some of these other bigger countries. And, you know, we kind of just are at an impasse and everybody's kind of building themselves back up while the dollar is just, you know, almost going in, in a Venezuelan kind of uh, or Zimbabwe manner here. Um, but the other path is we get presidents in there like Trump or like some of these others that would want to keep the strength in the dollar, recognizing the, the true power of Bitcoin and uh, maybe delaying that hyper Bitcoinization, which gives the builders time to build on the Lightning Network and other things like that so we can get to that place. Then maybe we have a you know an in between currency where it's maybe the dollar they try to back it by Bitcoin, but as humans do, they mess that up, and then eventually we get to a hyper Bitcoinized world. But um, so I, I think this is kind of the, the impasse that we're at. Harris, everything crashes and burns. Maybe it's good for the short term of Bitcoin, and then I think Trump it's it's kind of delaying that full crash and burn here. So um, maybe everybody always says it's the biggest election of our lives, but I, I'm not quite sure about all that. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I don't think the president can do too much in the current system because they only have four years and uh, there's a lot of checks and balances. But I do think, uh, you know, as far as like the Bitcoin policy and everything like that, I do think it is very important. That's uh, interesting, the landscape. I, I mean, I try to not like 
look too much at politics, but I recognize that even as a Bitcoiner, it's important to look at politics to a certain extent to see what's going on and to see what, what people are, are doing because you're still a physical person in a, in a country. And yes, Bitcoin will be successful no matter what, but you might suffer because you're in a specific country and, and, and the laws are not, not good for you. So I, I, I advocate more and more for people just like see what the politics in your area and in, in your region are and, and see how you might add a benefit or suffer from them. And maybe there's another region that is better or you can do something against it. Like that. We, we have to care a little bit about politics, even as Bitcoiners. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to go where the incentives lie, right? So we have obviously Nayib Bukele in El Salvador has been doing great things with, you know, uh, minimizing business tax and allowing basically tech and Bitcoin companies to come down there, be headquartered in El Salvador and, you know, not really have too many penalties. Before it was the U.S. The U.S. was the land of the entrepreneur, the American dream and everything like that. Now we're even seeing like pockets of the U.S. that aren't very friendly to entrepreneurs. We're seeing mass exodus out of booming states like California and New York to states like Texas and Florida. So the unique thing uh, to a European uh, guy uh, about the U.S. is that basically like every state, it, it can almost be looked at as like a different country at this point um, where the policies are different state to state. And that kind of, you know, it, it's unique where we have one un underlying um you know, government, but we also have state governments that make things friendly or not friendly. So um, I think we've seen it in the U.S. on a micro level where people have been migrating from, you know, blue states to red states, meaning Democratic to, to Republican states. And I think we'll see it on a macro level where people maybe will start to leave the U.S. or people will start to leave countries to more friendly countries like El Salvador or, um, you know, maybe if Argentina starts booming or Suriname, like all these other countries that are starting to embrace you know the tech and, and everything like that i think you know people are people are very smart they can move place to place very easily uh i think it will be hard for some people to obviously like leave their families and everything like that everybody's different but i think uh you know i've seen it in the bitcoin space and with you know the digital nomad kind of uh aspect and everything like that i think it makes it easier for entrepreneurs to go to different countries and I think that that's going to be a trend that we kind of see going forward, where we see a lot of businesses have maybe a location in a different country, but that person doesn't even live there, or they just have a PO box or something like that as their you know corporate headquarters, and you know they're just traveling the world and doing all these kind of things. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that people are going to go where the incentives lie, and the incentives in the U.S. are definitely waning for sure. Yeah, absolutely, it is also. It, it kind of cracks down on the on the strength of the US dollar. Also, if the US is not as attractive anymore, it's an interesting thing. It's it's kind of goes in this um, uh, global game theory of of nation states on a Bitcoin level, but also like on a sovereignty level. Uh, it's it, it's really cool. Did you already visited El Salvador? Yeah, I've been to El Salvador. I'm going again uh, to adopting Bitcoin here in November. I'm speaking um, and I got a panel and other things like that. So it's uh, I've been down there. It's it's great. I mean, you know, I, I think everybody in the Bitcoin space really props up El Salvador. I think it's absolutely great. And it's, you know, you can see a lot of improvements. A lot of people tell, tell you about, you know, the roads and everything like that coming up. But it's still got a ways to develop, right? I mean, I'm, I'm spoiled in the US here. Like I have hot water wherever I go. Like there's little things that you notice that still aren't there in El Salvador, but it's, you know, to be honest, it's, it started as like a third world country, one of the most dangerous countries in the world. I felt safer there than I do in a lot of big cities at night, you know, going out and being an idiot, getting drinking a couple beers and wandering around. I had no, no issue with anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, El Salvador is great and I think it's improving. I still think it has a ways to go. And I'm, you know, I'm confident that the way that Bukele has been running it in the next, what I think it's like four or five years, or however much his next term is, um, I think that's going to continue. So, um, you know, hopefully with everything like that, it, you know, still, still running strong, but uh, yeah, excited to go back again in November here. I'm also going in, in November, the first time ever uh, I will be adopting Bitcoin. I, I love it a lot. Like I had so many El Salvadorian people on my podcast the, the uh, past couple of months 
then I was like, ah, oh, I, I really have to visit at least once. I, <laughs> I want to, I want to know what's going on actually down there and not just like talk from third person <laughs> perspectives. Yeah, sure. Yeah, man. Let's do, yeah. Come on down. Let's, uh, let's go surfing or something, dude. I got, I got a guy, a local guy that I've, uh, been connected with and he gave me some great surfing lessons, uh, in El Tunco. So not necessarily the Bitcoin beach, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff, uh, down there. And I think, uh, I think every Bitcoiner should visit it. And, you know, I mean, to me, I'm just kind of like one of those guys that likes to travel a little bit. So I think everybody should go down there no matter what. I mean, it's beautiful country and uh, very safe, good food, all that kind of stuff. Are we seeing uh, right now in real life the, the sovereign individual kind of playing out when, when we look at uh, all the things that we are talking about with Bitcoin and, and uh, incentives around the world? Yeah, I mean, I, I 100% I believe that, right? I think at everybody's core, they really want to be a sovereign individual. And I think obviously that's a that's a message that uh, Bitcoiners kind of find. Um, but, you know, I mean, just at, on the ground here and I'm in Tampa, Florida. So, I mean, on the ground here, I always tell people, I think my friends are like 99% of the way there. They just don't realize that Bitcoin's the solution for a lot of this. A lot of people in the U.S. are starting to realize like they're pumping a bunch of antibiotics in the food that big pharma is not necessarily good. Obviously, we saw what what happened just four short years ago. And I think that opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, the one thing that they're, that they're still kind of hung up on is they find safety in the banks, even though we've seen, um, you know, big things like Silicon Valley Bank and other big bank crashes here in the U.S., they're still like, oh, my money's safe there. So I, I think that there's going to be need a, needing a little bit more pain to be felt in order for mass, uh, like the, the majority of people, at least in the U.S., from what I can tell, to, to understand that. But I think in the Bitcoin space, obviously, that's playing out, right? I mean, it's a no brainer here. Um, you know, I know plenty of people that are digital nomads traveling from place to place, um, going to all these different conferences, um, connecting with people from all over the globe. I mean, yeah, look, look at us here, right? I'm in Florida, you're, you're across in Europe and, and we're talking over this. I think, you know, all these people are kind of realizing that, that you don't really necessarily need to be, you know, locked into one specific place, go into the office, do that nine to five kind of grind. I think people are getting sick of that. And, uh, you know, I think that's occurring like all over the globe. So I think the sovereign individual is really playing out. And I think that that's going to continue. And uh, especially if, you know, governments try to overbear their power more and more, I think that that's going to continue to to push people to resist that. Right. I mean, you know, you just got to think everybody was a kid at one point in time. Right. I mean, uh, what, what did you always want to do against your parents whenever they told you to do something you wanted to rebel? Right. I mean, I don't think that we really get away from that necessarily i think we just get kind of programmed to tell to live in the simulation so to speak where you have to do this this and this but at everybody's core i think everybody wants to be you know a sovereign individual and really wants to you know find their path in that way in that sense will at some point the generation fight against bitcoin the, the bitcoin <laughs> monopoly <laughs> yeah um, what do you mean, like fight against the gen? The no, 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 no. I, I be just you, you just said like the the generation, uh, like you you fight against your parent parents. You you have a rebellion, and if we think long term out, and there's like a Bitcoin world, maybe there's a generation coming up that for some reason don't like some money, <laughs> they want something else. Uh, is it possible? Like, do do you see Bitcoin as the end all, be all, final money that that we have, and it, it's the perfect thing, but or do you think that's just the, the next step to maybe something even greater? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that won't happen really in our lifetime. I think like the, the way that it's going to develop uh, is still going to be looked at as like digital gold. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, you know, I mean, Parker Lewis always says the gradually then suddenly. I just don't know if we're really close to that suddenly impasse just yet. Um, but what I think is, uh, you know, I think that there's always going to be crypto and shitcoin tokens popping up. I think everybody's going to have that um, because there's just low barrier to entry. Like we could go on and create, uh, you know, Robin Sayer token or, uh, you know, Brandon or Green Candle token or something like that and just kind of, you know, pump and dump that. And I think that, that everybody gets a little bit curious and is still thinking in that fiat mindset. So, you know, what, what I always tell people is the biggest driver, the biggest orange pillar, whether we like it or not, is the Bitcoin price, right? So, you know, there's always going to be stories out there that of somebody who had invested into some crypto token and went from, 
you know, one dollar to a millionaire. And I think a lot of people are always going to be chasing that just because of, you know, the where, where we're at in society. Like everybody wants an easy kind of way out. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to take a while for us to get to that point where everybody's kind of working to become their own sovereign individual. Um, and so with all that being said, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of, you know, there's gradual adoption here in the U.S. and, and around the world. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, that gradual adoption is, uh, you know, going to be slowed just kind of by the, the crypto tokens and other unforeseen circumstances. And, you know, I, I still think that there's human greed out there. I don't know if Bitcoin will necessarily get rid of all of that. There was greed in ancient times when, you know, we were on a gold standard or just kind of a fixed fiat or a fixed standard, right? Whether it was seashells or whatever it was, right? So I think that there's always going to be some sort of greed, some sort of person trying to rip some people off um, and everything like that. So I, I don't think that in a hyper Bitcoinized world, it's necessarily going to be this like utopian uh, thing that a lot of Bitcoiners like to think it, it might be. But uh, I definitely think that a lot of corruption and a lot of things that we see is due to the money. And, uh, you know, the fiat system encourages chaos is, uh, is something I like to say, because, you know, if you think about it, COVID, war, whatever it is, you always got to pump money into the system. And who always profits off that? It's usually the people that are in charge. So I think we'll get away from a lot of that. Maybe wars won't necessarily stop. Uh, I think that they, they'll still be there. Um, but I think they'll be a less frequent. And, uh, you know, these boom and bust cycles that we've been seeing lately are going to be less frequent as well. So, you know, I don't know if we'll necessarily have people rebelling against Bitcoin, uh, not using it and trying to use that. I do think that there's going to be pop ups of other crypto tokens, um, just because there's just low barrier to entry. But you know, that with all that being said, like, do people really rebel and not use the dollar now? I think like everybody just uses what's easier in that sense, right? I mean, I think it's more of rebelling against the laws opposed to rebelling against the money. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's funny. I, I feel like more people should rebel against the fiat currencies, uh, especially like I, I get why people are still comfortable and safe in the US or in Austria and Europe somewhere because Yes, we have inflation. Yes, it's bad, but it's not imminent bad. Like it's not like, oh, you go one day to the supermarket and the banana is one dollar. All of a sudden next week, the banana is two dollars. Like we don't have crazy inflation. We have really bad inflation and even one percent inflation is too much inflation. But it's not like people are completely uh, freaked out and completely like that. But we have countries like Argentina, like Turkish Lira, where the inflation is like that, like from Argentina, I, I just got from someone uh, from Ariel from the Argentinian prophecy uh, offer guy uh, uh, was on my podcast and he said like in the last five years, uh, the salary in Argentina developed drastically bad. Like five years ago, the average salary of someone in, living in Argentina was a thousand US dollars. Now it's 300 US dollars. So like, there are actually big problems in those countries, <laughs> but still they, they flee to the US dollar, they flee not to Bitcoin. They, they, there are so many distractions going on. Like what has to happen that people see Bitcoin? They have to feel the pain, man. I mean, that's that's why a lot of people in these countries that have experienced hyperinflation get Bitcoin, right? I mean, you know, if you look at the US dollar, exactly like you said, right? I mean, like, I don't know. I work a nine to five job. Hopefully I'm out of it soon. But theoretically, my salary is going to go up 3% at a minimum, really, right? I mean, majority of people see that. And, you know, majority of people in the COVID time saw I could jump from a, in an office job to an, a remote job and be making $30,000 more by doing the same exact thing. They make a lateral move, different company because of all of that. So I think, you know, one, there's going to be need to be tough economic times that are explained by the dollar, right? I mean, in 2008, everybody saw it. They were like, oh, it's the housing crisis. It was the banks just lending out a bunch of money. And that was the issue. It wasn't the underlying currency. It was just that basically money was free at that point, And uh, people didn't really equate it to that. So it's whatever they could sell here in this next crisis, that if the American people are really buying what they're putting down, 
they're going to just equate it to everything's fine. The problem is, is a majority of Americans right now, what we've been off the gold standard since 1971. So 53 years, everybody in the working age right now has never experienced a gold standard or a hard money standard of anything like that. Uh, you know, essentially ever, unless you got somebody who's working at 80 years old, maybe they, you know, I mean, even then, right. I mean, the only time they experienced that was that like when they were 14 or something like that. Right. So, um, you know, I think, uh, people just haven't experienced that. It's all they know. They've basically equated like, this is what you do, like get in line. And, uh, you know, I think that that's until that system is, uh, you know, I guess in a sense, just either crumbling or something falls or breaks around them, they're not going to really get it. Uh, you know, I think that's why Latin America is so big on Bitcoin because they've had a lot of, you know, currencies either get hyperinflated and a lot of people have experienced hyperinflation or they're on the opposite side of things and they're, you know, run by the U.S. in a sense uh, with the U.S. dollar and the U.S. prints all this money, gives all the way this stimulus and these Latin American countries just don't profit off of it and don't experience any of it. So I think, you know, with all that being said, I think in the U.S., Europe, all these other places, they're going to have to experience pain. It's the it's the biggest driver, the biggest lesson. Um, you know, I think everybody kind of looks at Bitcoin now as some um, funny Internet money or something like that or a way to get rich um, and you know, rich in fiat terms. And so with all that, you know, it's, it's really going to take, you know, something about the currency that you use, whether it's the euro or the dollar or the pound or something like that to really, really just. Uh, push the average person over the edge because majority of people just don't even like to think about money and how it's coming in or anything like that. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable it's extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously fear for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code Robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You you have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Uh, it's really interesting. When I, when I hear that, it's also for me it gets sometimes hard to believe that we have a peaceful revolution. We always say like the Bitcoin will be a peaceful revolution and we will a peaceful transition to 
to to the Bitcoin. But if if a large majority only sees the problem when they are in pain, as this means a lot of people are in pain uh, at that point. It, that, there can be a lot of things go really wrong at that, that point. Do, do you do you subscribe to like a peaceful revolution in Bitcoin? I well, I mean, it's it's how how you look at it, right? So, I mean, it depends what country you're in. Um, you know, I can only speak on what I see in like the U.S., um, which obviously has the dollar and everything. The way I see it now is. I think the U.S. has never been more divided um, as far as like political things, you know, go. Uh, I feel like every election that we have, everybody gets very much more upset. Um, you know, we kind of saw it in, um, you know, during 2020 where, you know, if you didn't get the, you know, the jab or anything like that, you know, people were yelling at you saying you're the worst, you're killing all these people, all that, right? For stuff that, like, quite frankly, wasn't really baked. Uh, based on any types of facts or anything like that. Um, so I think, you know, from a political standpoint, I know it's not always all around that, but I think from a political standpoint, people in the U.S. are very divided. Um, and I think, you know, from a monetary standpoint, people are even more divided. You know, every time there's a, a crash or something like that, there the wealth gap increase, right? Asset prices skyrocket. Um, people with homes, businesses, everything like that, and the the average person who's working a salary job, you know, can't really afford as much. Maybe needs to sell off their savings and everything like that. So I think the more of these cycles that we go through, where you know there's boom and bust and asset prices rise like crazy. I think the rich are going to get richer, the poor are going to get poorer, and then the poor are, are basically going to rebel. And I think that that's continuing in the U.S. And it's just a matter of how much money printing we're going to go through. And that gap is just going to keep widening. So I think if that gap keeps widening, which I don't see a way that it can't, you know, we're in this debt spiral. We're going to have to either print more money to to get out the debt or print money to buy Bitcoin and, you know, kind of hope that it, uh, in a sense, Bitcoin, uh, you know, uh, helps the U S and we use it as a strategic reserve here. Um, you know, I, I, I just don't see a, a world where, um, you know, the wealth gap, uh, the political pressures, the geopolitical pressures with everything going across, across the pond here and just the devaluation of the dollar. You know, I just don't see a way that this ends where everything is all peaches and daisies and we're just like, oh, you know, everybody just bends over and is like, oh, you, you guys can use Bitcoin. It's great. I think the powers that be are always going to want to stay in power and they're going to do whatever they can to do that. How do you see um, all those fiat related institutions like Social Security and, uh, and Forex Exchange and like all, all those fiat related markets that have a lot of power and a lot of influence right now, but might not have all that influence and power when, when we come to a happiness world? I mean, Social Security is like the biggest Ponzi scheme in, you know, in, in history at this point. I mean, there's no, there's no money to pay it out, but somehow we keep paying it out. How is that going to continue to happen? I mean, we're just going to have to print more money. So, you know, it's Social Security should be something that, you know, I, I mean, in a hyper Bitcoinized world, everything that you know, parents in the US and I'm sure your parents kind of raised you on is all, all great, right? Save, just save money, save your way and you'll be able to live, uh, you know, a happy life if you're able to save, right? Because your money would theoretically, you know, grow in purchasing power while you're saving and getting older and older and older. And so if you're able to save in a hyper Bitcoinized world, you don't really need a uh, social security to help bail you out when you're, um, you know, old and crusty and you can barely walk up and down stairs. Right. I think, um, you know, at a certain point, a uh, hyper Bitcoinized world or a hard money standard or something like that, a lot of these policies are not necessarily needed. You know, retirement funds, 401ks, um, you know, that was basically started as a big scam because the way that inflation was going, uh, you know, uh, companies just didn't want to give everybody as much of a raise as inflation. So they, you know, said, hey, let us help manage your money and we'll put it in this 401k, which will devalue uh, over time and money that will devalue over time, but we'll help invest it for you for the long period of time. And we don't have to pay taxes on it. In fact, we actually get a tax break for businesses for that. So you know, I think retirement accounts, I think Social Security, all that stuff is is almost a sham here in the U.S. at least. I mean, I know a lot of these policies, um, you know, try to make it where they're friendly for you. 
I think there's very few that are actually good accounts that, you know, the average person, if you're good with your money needs, I think if everybody can kind of just you know, take a couple hours to learn what to do with their money the best, I think everybody would come to the conclusion, just buy Bitcoin and hold it. Um, and, you know, that'll be the best way to protect your purchasing power. You don't have to become like a stock trader or anything like that. And, uh, you know, but I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people just don't want to think about their money, don't want to think about, you know, anything like that. So they'd rather give that responsibility to someone else instead of taking the personal responsibility. And that, I think, is just because they're in a job that they don't like, which, you know, they're and they're forced to work there 40 hours a week. They're, you know, eating food that is essentially poisoning them. And then they get tired, you know, after driving the hour to work, hour to back. So they're spending, you know, 60 hours a week all about their job. Their personality needs to be their job. They need to go to happy hours to please their boss, to kiss some ass, to move up. And then, you know, with all that, then they're too tired to go back and enjoy time with their wife or kids or whatever. And, you know, I think it's just this never ending cycle that that the fiat system puts you in where, you know, you don't really want to think about money or something else that causes you stress. And so because people don't think about that, you know before it's too late before it's too late it either causes a, a divorce or something along those lines i mean you know that's why we see a lot of the problems here in the world and i think that's why you know bitcoiners kind of resonate like fix the money fix the world so much because of all the underlying issues and stresses and things like that that money causes i think uh you know bitcoin can help fix a lot of those things it's really interesting the, for me the phrase uh fix the money fix the world um and 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 sometimes it, it goes too far for me <laughs> sometimes i feel like uh, we we think the law oh, yeah, like once we have bitcoin like there will be nothing else like we don't have any problems at all then um uh and and, and i think you don't see it like that but um what, what do you think does bitcoin not solve like even in a hyper bitcoinized world we have some money we don't have any fiat institution left like what are the problems? What are the things in the world that are wrong that still will be there? I think there's still going to be fiat institutions. I still think that there's going to be banks. I still think that there's going to be people that are like, you know, it's it's all self-responsibility at a certain point, right? So I still think there's going to be scammers out there. Hey, I mean, we've seen it already. People in Bitcoin that send Bitcoin to random people because, um, you know, somebody left a comment on my YouTube the other day. I was like, hey, like, yeah, like, I don't need any more Bitcoin. I scammed people out of 7.5 Bitcoin. And it's like, all right, cool, man. Like you scammed people, but like you didn't really like provide value to get that that Bitcoin. So I still think there's going to be people out there, no matter what, if they believe in Bitcoin and everything like that, there's still the human greed. People wanted to take shortcuts and everything like that. So I think the overarching theme of Bitcoin is great. And I do think that people in general will be better people. I still think there's going to be bad apples. Situations that, you know, people got raised in or whatever that caused them to be some way, whatever we explain it to be. Um, you know, I, I still think that there's still going to be people out there that try to rebel, go against something, try to find a way, try to find a cheap shortcut you know, to, to get rich, uh, try to scam their way, that kind of stuff. I don't think that, you know, we're going to really be someplace where it's a, this perfect utopia and everybody's like, you know, uh, perfect and kind of working that way. I still think that there's, you know, people still have free reign. And I think, uh, you know, some people will choose to use that in a negative light, but I think majority of people will, will in a hyper Bitcoinized world, get to a point where you know, everything is peaches and daisies for, for majority of people. Do you think that things like, um, I think that's one of my favorite things like to say, like this, this green energy lie, I think you even mentioned it once time in your podcast, um, where a lot of companies are even virtue signaling and like, oh yeah, we are a green company, green company. And then they're doing it all like my favorite examples is like really politicians drive with like, uh, a, plane somewhere and drive with the car somewhere and right before it they hop on the bike for like a few meters will we have still those 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 things in a, in a, in a bitcoin world is, is that, that kind of the scamming that we still will be seeing yeah i mean everything's just a facade right i mean everything in in the bitcoin or in a, a fiat world is f uh, you know fugazi fugazi right i mean that was seen in the world of wall street where the guys like you know just you sell these people on these penny stocks and like maybe it goes up maybe it won't you you don't really know you know i think that that's uh you know everything will be kind of a, a facade and you know it's 
uh, you know, I'm reading that book, the, the 48 Laws of Power right now. And it's kind of like, you know, whatever the perception is, is something that, uh, you know, can kind of help people control things, right? So I think that's what a lot of people, you know, give off, right? I mean, and you're seeing it in a lot of the political races, like, how are these people trying to be in power? Well, you know, you got Taylor Swift endorsing Kamala Harris, right? But what does Taylor Swift do? Taylor Swift flies a private jet every day all across the globe, right? I mean, she uses, her carbon footprint is bigger than me, you, and probably everybody that listens to this podcast combined. And, uh, you know, and, and but she's the one endorsing for green energy and everything like that. But is green energy really green, right? I mean, it's all a perception, right? I mean, you go to, you know, Africa and people digging up uh, you know, big giant trucks of lithium for these electronic vehicles. And then they can't, you know, recycle these electron or these uh, big giant batteries. And it just pollutes the world and everything like that. But it's the perception that you're doing things right, right? I mean, it's not uh, good in, you know, feasibility sense, but it makes people feel good that it's green. Oh, I'm helping the environment and everything like that. Um, and so it's all the perception. And that's how people have been able to control people, um, you know, because they perceive that they're doing something good and lighthearted. And I think that, you know, that's one of the things that the 48 Laws of Power talks about is like, if you can be perceived that you're doing something good, and it makes you, you know, an emotional, you know, response, and, um, you know, you'll, you'll kind of be more likely to do that. I mean, you look at like charities, uh, charities are a big example, right? In the US, a lot of charities are some of the most corrupt organizations in the US, because you can donate to these charities, you get a tax break and you feel good about it because you're donating to some charities. But majority of these people just, you know, launder the money or they, um, you know, utilize charities as some back end to get a tax break. And they don't necessarily, um, you know, uh, do whatever that cause is saying. And because it's a nonprofit and they don't worry about making money, they can't fail, essentially. And so I think, you know, a lot of these things like this, um, you know, it's all about perception. And I think that's where the green energy policies have kind of lied. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of things in the U.S. and in the fiat system are still there. I think, um, you know, like I said, I think as long as there's uh, still places where you could deceive people and everything's not fully open source and you can see everything, there's still privatized businesses and everything like that. You're never going to really know. It's all about it's at a certain point. There's always going to be a little bit aspect of trust here or there. Um, we're not going to be in a truly decentralized world where you have to, you know, you can, you know, just raise a cow, raise your whole family. And you don't need to interact with everybody. You're going to have to interact with people, you know, in order to help the society prosper. And at a certain point, you're going to have to trust somebody to help you out. And so, you know, are we going to put the right people that we can trust in those places? you know, you never really know, right? I mean, you, you you would hope in a hyper Bitcoinized world that it encourages people to do that. But, you know, as we've seen in history, uh, you know, you get a, a corrupt politician or somebody corrupt in charge uh, that can set back uh, the entire nation or, you know, the globe for years to years at a time. And so I think that that could be you know, something that I that I deeply worry about. And I think that, you know, Bitcoiners almost undermine that in a sense where it's, uh, you know, everything's going to be great and there's greener pastures ahead. I definitely think that there is, but I definitely, you know, am, am a little bit more cautious where I think that, you know, not everything is going to be, you know, perfect in a Bitcoinized world. Absolutely. And by the way, the, the 48 powers of law, I think something with Green, Robert Green or something like that is to, yeah. was to offer. Uh, it's it's on my audible list for a long, a long time. Is it is it a good one? Should, is that something I, I should listen to? Yeah, I'm about like I think I'm in like uh, the 24th or no, I'm on the 26th law right now. So it is it is very long, even an audio book. I think it's it's a pretty long uh, listen, but um, you know I think it's it's very yeah, it's it's interesting, right? I mean, it's just kind of I think um, you know books like that to me are you know I, I wouldn't call it like a self help book or anything like that, but I. I think it's interesting how, um, you know, a lot of people come to the same conclusions, whether it's, uh, you know, books about, I don't know, how to get women or books about, you know, how to raise your money. Uh, all of them kind of have the same undertone and it's just presented to you in a different manner. Um, 
you know, and then people have talked about this book and kind of a, a way that it can help you uh, just kind of figure out your true true self and get, get in that sense. And I think, you know, for me, I'm a very analytical thinker, just being able to figure out the explanation as to why uh, things and people did this, uh, did whatever action it is. Um, I think it, it, it kind of helps me a lot. So um, I recommend it. I, I'm not completely done with it yet. I still got what 22, 23 laws to, to get through, but I think so far from what I'm learning, it's, it's good. And it's something that I'm probably going to keep on rotation and keep reverting back to, uh, following this, uh, following when I finish it for sure. Oh, really cool. I was just curious because, uh, I, I was like, ah, I heard good things about it, but, uh, it, it's a long one. I, I don't remember how many hours it was on audible, but it, it, it was, it was a long one. And this was something very long. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to get into this right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you got Spotify, uh, I think the Spotify premium, it, it comes with it. So, uh, I kept getting it recommended to me. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll see it. Um, you know, I, I listened to some podcasts and I listened to audio books in my free time and, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, it's one that it's like, all right, I can throw it on. Don't really need to think. It tells a lot of stories is, is kind of like throughout history. And that's how, um, you know, Robert Greene essentially like studied power. He would go and look at old stories, old tales in history, read autobiographies and things like that, and just see how people in power acted and, you know, how they kind of became in power and, um, really deeply analyzing that. And I think, uh, it's really interesting in that, in that aspect. And I, I recommend it for sure. The one last topic that I really want to get into with you is uh, Bitcoin personal finance. There are a lot of uh, interesting uh, discussion around that uh, when we get into like, oh, should should I, if, if I have a bunch of Bitcoin and I have feared uh, bills to pay, should I sell Bitcoin, spend Bitcoin, should I get a, a loan against Bitcoin? Uh, then there are a, a few people that also get paid in Bitcoin. What are they doing? So there's like, um, a, a huge topic. I want to start with the one question. Um, when you live on a hundred percent Bitcoin standard, like you have everything in Bitcoin and then there's this like one weird expense coming that you kind of have to deal with. Uh, are you in favor of like spending some of your Bitcoin or getting a Bitcoin backed loan or in general, what, what would you recommend doing on, on a personal finance model? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. It's, a, it's, a, it depends on like what your really, your goals are and where you're kind of getting to, right. I think everybody should, you know, try to encourage the circular network, spend Bitcoin when they can, uh, maybe not, you know, spend, uh, maybe have like a stack for saving and a stack for spending, uh, that kind of aspect of it. Um, you know, I think uh, if you're 100 percent Bitcoin, you essentially give yourself no choice, right? You've got to spend your Bitcoin. You've got to pay your bills. Um, you know, I think, you know, Bitcoiners in a, in a sense, you know, you could essentially pay for almost anything in Bitcoin, uh, these days, right? I mean, we've got AirBTC where you can, you know, stay at an Airbnb. You've got bit refill places you could buy, uh, gift cards, some other places too, where you can buy that. I know like in Florida here, we've got the beef initiative. You can buy, um, beef and, and eggs and things like that. Um, raw milk, you know, what? Uh, there's a lot of different things that are, are growing and people accept Bitcoin for. Uh, I think you should always encourage those those local people and spend Bitcoin in that. But, you know, I'm not an idiot. I know that, you know, you're still probably going to need to pay your power bill or your mortgage in fiat. And, uh, you know, those are going to be, you know, expenses that come out and they're not going away every single month. I do think that, you know, you should uh, do that. If you're earning in Bitcoin, it's great. I think you should, uh, you know, spend it and everything like that. The one difficult thing in the U.S. and I, and I think that, you know, maybe in, in Europe, too, I'm not quite sure all about the laws, but the difficult thing in the U.S. is spending Bitcoin. It has a lot of tax implications right now. So, um, you know, when you go to different places like El Salvador and, you know, maybe Argentina here soon or other places that have more of these like circular economies. I know like, you know, Bitcoin jungle in Costa Rica and some of these other places, I encourage people to spend Bitcoin there. You know, it is difficult uh, in the US and I encourage people to consult a tax professional because I think, you know, at a certain point, the tax man's going to come knocking in the US. Um, they're essentially attacking Bitcoin and they I like to, call, you know, they call it choke point 2.0, right? They, they're attacking Bitcoin in the 
I guess, the self-sovereignty, the non-KYC route where, you know, they're making it very difficult for Lightning wallets um, to have non-KYC. So you have KYC like Strike or Cash App, you're sending Bitcoin. They're going to have to report it because they're companies and, uh, you know, because they're going to have to report it. Then, you know, you're going to have the tax man basically come knocking on you soon. So I think, you know, spending in the U.S., I encourage it for smaller things. Uh, it's, it is very difficult for bigger, larger items. Um, and I, I think it will be tough and be made tougher here, um, depending on who gets elected to. Um, but I definitely think like, you know, people should try to live on a Bitcoin standard if they could ride the volatility from month to month of Bitcoin. Um, definitely do that. Uh, I do think it is a little tougher, you know, obviously with uh, the exchange rate and kind of prices being fixed and whatnot uh, here in the U.S., but uh, yeah, I mean, I think people should should do what really works for them. Sit, sit in the mirror and kind of evaluate it in that sense. Um, you know, I try to live on uh, as much of a Bitcoin standard as I possibly can. Um, you know, I pay editors and other things like that in Bitcoin. And, and uh, you know, I kind of encourage people to try to do that as much as possible. But like I said, it is uh, there is a lot of tax implications in the U.S. to do that for sure. Absolutely. Um, I heard that a lot. Uh, never really asked myself that. What is choke point 2.0? Yeah, so they're basically cutting off on ramps onto onto Bitcoin. So like they're making it difficult where um, banks are, you know, if you're uh, putting money from your bank, you know, into uh, Coinbase or something like that, they're kind of flagging that account. And uh, if you're, you know, putting a bunch of money in at once, say you move 10 grand into Coinbase in one day to buy Bitcoin and then you immediately try to take it off, they'll flag that immediately um, because of what you're trying to do. So um, they're basically just cutting off on ramps into Bitcoin exchanges and uh, basically in, in my eyes, like cutting off the privacy aspect of it. So I think, uh, you know, Bitcoin privacy in the U.S. is, is definitely something that's uh, it's pretty scary. You know, I mean, we've seen this, the samurai guys go down, um, get arrested. Telegram CEO got arrested. Um, you know, I think a lot of these aspects, a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, private ways to move Bitcoin are, uh, you know, under attack for sure. And I, I think that that'll change because more people are going to start to rebel against it. And, you know, I think people are kind of sick of that. But um, in the short term, it is definitely a worry. And you need to educate politicians here in the US to, to help uh, get away from that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do agree with that a lot. Uh, really cool. Perfect. And let's come to the end routine. Uh, one question that I always ask my guests, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we talked about besides uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I think like one thing to take away, you know, you, you talked about uh, spending and, you know, living on a Bitcoin standard. One thing I think that, uh, you know, is still there for a lot of people is the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, I, I've been building Green Candle for a couple years now. Um, but the reason I've been able to do this and hopefully take full time here in the next few months, um, the, the reason I've been able to do that is because I worked the fiat job and I saved in Bitcoin. Um, and then, of course, that appreciated, allowing me to put more money into my business, you know, over time. And, you know, I think Bitcoiners in general really get into that hodl mentality. Uh, I think, you know, don't be afraid to spend your Bitcoin because I think, you know, investing in yourself at, at a certain point in time is, is something that everybody should do. And it's, you know, what do you believe in more, yourself or Bitcoin? And I think everybody should really take a look in the mirror and and really, uh, you know, evaluate that. And if you don't believe in yourself by that more than Bitcoin, then why? Um, you know, I think everybody should almost have that sense of delusion and uh, really try to go for it because I think money always comes back around, whether it's Bitcoin or fiat or whatever it is. And so I think everybody should, you know, really just look at that and, you know, look at how they want to paint their life and not be afraid to, to spend their Bitcoin to help encourage something and to, to greener pastures. Of course, I'm not saying go to the clubs and buy bottle service with, uh, with your Bitcoin, but, you know, if you're investing in yourself and investing in a business, uh, and a way for you to to make your future better. I, I encourage everybody to do that and and save in the short term for in Bitcoin and then in the long term invest in yourself and that'll just pay off dividends. Uh, that's a that's a beautiful beautiful learning, really really cool. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for doing it. We have now one more end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, the question from the previous guest for you is, how do you orange pill your closest family members? They seem to be the, the hardest ones to orange pill. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's that's a very tough question because uh, I think you know I I think how you can uh, orange pill them is is just slow and steady, man. You can't really force it down their throats. They're never gonna re really listen to you. Um, you know, I think it's just you got to let them come to them, uh, let them come to you. Excuse me. And I think um, you know people in a sense uh, always are a little curious about it. Um, and then just keep growing and like everybody will get curious and then ask you how you did it, whatever it is, um, whether it's getting rich, buying, I don't know, rental properties, uh, you know, quitting your job and traveling the world. People always ask you, well, how did you do that? And then, you know, once they see the results of what you're building yourself, everybody will get curious. And then that's how they'll kind of start to come to you. Um, and I think that's just with with people in general, but more so with the people that are closest to you. And I think the people that are closest to you are always going to be watching the closest too. So that's why I think, um, you know, that that'll be the way to, to orange pill them. I, I've tried, you know, gifting Bitcoin. I've tried shoving it down their throats. I've tried all that stuff. And to be honest, I just, I've given up at this point. And I think that's the way that I'm going to have to go about it now is let them come to me. Yeah, that's uh, I think the most efficient way. Also, and I noticed like when you when you're in a group and they know that you're the Bitcoiner, uh, you should never be the, the aggressive one pushing it. You should always be just like the one that answers questions if there are questions. And the funny thing is, then after that, they come in private uh, with pr in private chats to you and like, hey, how is that actually? And hey, can I buy? Where can I buy? It's like it's never in a group thing, uh, and it's it's really. Just be there for, for people if they have questions and the, the rest will come. That's that's a great learning. Thank you so much. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that. And I think, yeah, that's the that's the best way to do it. It'll save you a lot of stress and it'll save them a lot of stress. Absolutely. Perfect. And uh, thank you so much, Brandon, for, for being on my show. Uh, where Before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people uh, find out more about you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so thanks so much for having me on. It has been an honor to, to be on this. Uh, everybody smash the like button and subscribe button for my, my buddy Robin here. But uh, you can find me, uh, Green Candle, uh, on anywhere you get podcasts or YouTube. Uh, just search that, uh, smash the subscribe button and uh, tell a friend to tell a friend. And then uh, Green Candle IT, uh, somebody has Green Candle on all Instagram, TikTok and Twitter and all that. And Noster too, you can find me all those places, same handle. Um, and if you know the person that has the green candle handle on all of them, send them my way and just t tell them to give it to me so I can uh, switch it over and drop the IT. But um, yeah, man, thanks so much for having me on. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.